Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kim Hillebrand, she, her, hers, and I'm the program manager at the Kauffman Interfaith Institute at Grand Valley State University. On behalf of all of my colleagues at the Institute, we welcome you to the Grand Dialogue in Science and Religion, Interfaith Imperatives for Climate Action. The Grand Dialogue in Science and Religion is an inter-institutional, interdisciplinary, and interfaith exploration of science and religion. The dialogue seeks to find positive ways of relating these two great ideas in a constructive dialogue. Participating organizations each have their own unique perspectives, focus, message, and intended audience. But by cooperating, we affirm the willingness to be open to various issues and perspectives in a spirit of mutual respect. As we begin our time together, let's pause to acknowledge the land on which we gather today. We recognize the people of the three fires, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi peoples on whose land we are gathered. The three fires people are indigenous to this land, which means that this is their ancestral territory. Every university, congregation, institution, business, home, and monument in West Michigan is built on stolen native land. We are guests on their land, and one way to practice right, right relations is to develop genuine ways to acknowledge the histories and traditions of the people who originated here first, who are still here, and who tend to the land always. As we make this land acknowledgement, we know it is but an important first step, and that there are many more that we need to take when we decide to engage in the important work of social justice and equity. Once again, welcome to everyone here who is taking part in this afternoon's panel discussions. Since this space is designed to foster understanding and dialogue, I'd like to offer a couple of housekeeping reminders. Please make use of the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and feel welcome to send in any questions you may have for our panelists as they arise. And our moderators will do their best to integrate your questions throughout the discussion. At this point, I would like to introduce our moderator for the first panel discussion, the Reverend Nuria Love Parrish, Executive Director of Plainsong Farm and Ministry and Rector of the Holy Spirit Episcopal Church. Raised in an agnostic family in Las Vegas, Nevada, the Reverend Nuria Love Parrish became a Christian in her 20s while preparing for Unitarian Universalist Ministry at Harvard Divinity School. While serving Fountain Street Church in Grand Rapids as an associate pastor, she discovered the Episcopal Church's practices of prayer and governance. She sought reordination in the Episcopal Church where she has been a priest for a decade. She began work as the founding executive director of Plainsong Farm and Ministry in 2015 in response to a call from God and a hope for the future of the planet and the church, adding ministry with Holy Spirit Episcopal Church in 2017. Reverend Parrish, Thank you so much for being with us, and I will now turn things over to you. Thank you so much, Kim, and everyone at the Kaufman Interfaith Institute. It is truly an honor to be um, invited to moderate this panel. Um, and when we had our first conversation among the panelists, I was grateful for the opportunity to learn um, in, in just in that short moment um, that we had preparing for today. And I'm even more excited for the conversation that we're about to have where we don't have to prepare for the panel, we can be the panel. So without further ado, I wanna introduce the people from who, um, who, with whom I'm looking forward to discovering um, new possibilities today. And I'm going to be doing that um, using words that may or may not be available to everyone um, that would be uh, part of the reason that you registered for this. Um, I'm excited to introduce to you Huda Alkaf, who's founder and director of Wisconsin Green Muslims. She's an ecologist, environmental educator, and um, Wisconsin Green Muslims was created as an environmental justice group in 2005. To be able to connect faith and environmental justice and sustainability and healing through education and service. She has advocated for environmental justice, initiating Muslim and interfaith programs on energy and water conservation for over two decades. I'm, I'm in, in order to have more time for us to talk to each other, I'm going to just be highlighting the bios, but they're all available on the Kaufman Center website. I'm also excited to introduce 
Nathan Jashin Nishan. And Nathan uh, is actually a reverend doctor and an ordained Buddhist priest in the Koyasan Shingon tradition of Japan. He's an interfaith minister and co-director of the Interfaith Ministry for the Unity and Diversity World Council based in Los Angeles. His comparative religion master's is from Western Michigan, and then he completed an MDiv in Buddhist chaplaincy and a PhD in history and cultures of religions. I'm also excited to introduce to you Gopal Patel. He is the co-founder and director of Bumi Global and has been a faith-based environmental activist, campaigner, and consultant for over 10 years. He's worked in that time in India, East Africa, Europe, and North America. As a recognized global leader in the religious environmental movement, he regularly works with religious and spiritual communities in addressing our current environmental crises. He, among other places that he has visited in his work are Buckingham Palace and the White House and the United Nations. And I'm uh, wrapping up our panel um, in, um, introductions by, with great um, honor and gratitude, introducing Frank Adewagishek. Frank lives in Harbor Springs, Michigan, and he served in tribal elected office for 16 years, 14 of which he was the tribal chairman of the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Ottawa Indians in Harbor Springs, Michigan. He is the executive director of the United Tribes of Michigan and serves on several nonprofit boards, including as president of the Association on American Indian Affairs, which is the oldest nonprofit organization serving Indian country. As we began our conversation today, and that's really what I'm looking forward to as a conversation, I wanted to offer some opening words from a tradition, not my own, it's from the Jewish uh, leader, Nigel Savage, who founded an organization called Hazon, actually a staff member from that organization is in the second panel today. And Nigel, who is a friend and on it, but more of an inspiration than a friend says, at their best, religious traditions build ongoing bridges backwards and forwards between noble and idealistic visions on one side and the daily challenges and choices of human behavior on the other. And that's, those words spoke to me because I made an intentional decision to practice a religious tradition at a point in my life. And whether or not we, were, we inherit a tradition, whether or not we choose to practice a tradition is a choice that we have to make for ourselves and my hope is that we learn today from and with one another the value and the, the benefit of what we inherit in these traditions. So as we gather online, we are not people on screens, we are people on earth. And so I, what I'm going to do is invite each of our panelists um, to say something about where you are, like a tangible physical location, and describe your work there in your own words. And I'll go ahead and uh, I'll invite um, Gopal if you would begin. Thank you, Nuria. It's great to be with you. And thank you for the organizers for having me. So I am in a relatively new place for me. I, I recently moved to northern New Jersey in the town of Montclair. Um, I was living in New York City before then. And I'm still learning about this place and the history. Um, but the work I do from here, as you mentioned in the introduction, is to try and work with Hindu groups and other faith leaders um, across the United States and globally as well on specifically around the sustainable development goals with a focus on, on climate change and biodiversity. Thank you. Nathan, where are you today? What work are you doing? Hi, thank you. Um, well, I am currently in Michigan, um, but if the borders weren't closed, I would be in Japan right now um, and I was supposed to be working there, but what, that is where I've been for most of the past several years. And um, I recently completed a Fulbright research period and a dissertation on um, the creation of Buddhist chaplaincy and interfaith chaplaincy programs in Japan. And have mostly been uh, um, living and working out of Sendai in the Tohoku region, which is where they had the very large earthquake and tsunami about a decade ago. And so in Japan, um, a large part of the chaplaincy and spiritual care efforts um, have to deal with 
disaster care and crisis care. And of course, that's very um, linked to environment and global warming nowadays because natural disasters are not decreasing by any means. Um, and so the care provided to the victims and survivors is very important. And I was with several groups that were working on that care. Thank you. And that directly connects to our concerns for climate, obviously. I'm going to invite Huda, if you would um, tell us next where you are and what the work is that you're doing um, these days. Yes, thank you. So I start uh, in the name of God, the most gracious, most merciful. I greet you with the Islamic greeting, Assalamu Alaikum. Um, today I'm joining you from the traditional Potawatomi land called West Bend in Wisconsin. For 16 years now, Wisconsin Green Muslims works on environmental justice issues as it relates to climate change, clean air and pure water, healthy food, solar energy and energy efficiency, waste reduction and responsible transportation. This year, Wisconsin Green Muslims celebrates our 16th Green Ramadan campaign, whereby each day during Ramadan, the Islamic holy month of the Quran and daily fasting from food and drink, including water from dawn till dusk, we celebrate virtually daily action items with the community centering environmental and climate justice and energy, water, food, and transit equity. Thank you. Frank, uh, where are you today and what work are you doing? I'm sitting in a chair in my office, looking out the window at the leaves coming out in the woods and the leeks growing and thinking about what a, what a wonderful day it is. And that idea that everything is in balance there. And uh, you know where I what I the work that I do, I'm a citizen of the Waganuk Singodawak or the Ottawa at the Crooked Tree Place, uh, that's in Harbor Springs, Michigan, and up along the shore at the tip of the Lower Peninsula of Michigan. Uh, as you mentioned in the introduction, I, I'm involved in a lot of different things, but I'm I do a lot of work on climate change issues. And I've had occasion to work uh, to, for, I was at the Paris Climate Talks, for instance, where the Paris Accord was put together. And I've been very active with the Indigenous Caucus, the Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change. And we've been working, uh, you know, in the in how that uh, the Paris Accord was put together and had influence and and uh, had an opportunity to to be there for that, and ever since then we've been working on trying to find ways to bring our traditional values from the various indigenous peoples into this discussion, and that whole part of that whole thing is that is that uh, you know we're all related. And that means all, I mean, it's all of creation. We all have a re, like a, a relative. It's not, it's not a matter of ownership. And so those are the things that I work on pretty much almost every day. I'm working on in some aspect of, of conveying this message or helping people to see and find it. Thank you. Frank, this is a beautiful segue into our, our main, our first questions. Um, but before we get there, I should also say um, today I'm sitting in my office at Holy Spirit Episcopal Church in Belmont, Michigan. Um, and this is one of two places that I seek to serve God and my, um, and my neighbor. And uh, this is the place where I preached this morning. And then tomorrow I will go to Plain Song Farm, um, which is a ministry that I founded, uh, co-founded which cultivates connections between people, places, and God by making a place that nurtures belonging and the radical renewal of God's world. So it is in the Christian tradition, um, but we also say it's open to people of every faith and none. Um, all of us belong on God's as part of God's making. Um, and that's my theological uh, tradition, uh, which is not a universal one. And that's the most exciting thing to me about today is to be able to learn and discuss. Um, when we gathered to prepare for this panel, we, um, there was a brief conversation about how, and, and I need to credit Gopal for this, um, it, often in these kind of interfaith um, experiences, people um, say, well, this is, this is what my tradition teaches, or this is what my tradition is doing. Um, but it is, um, it, there's not always the sense of the why um, and how our whys may connect. And uh, 
we realized that the at the core of what what we're doing and why we're doing it is related to accountability and related to healing and then we discovered that actually we didn't really quite know from each other's traditions how each of our traditions um, understood accountability and understood healing um, obviously both of those themes are essential for the life of the spirit and they're also essential for the life of the planet and so that's really where we want to um, focus most of our time today is hearing from one another about um, how we, our traditions under, that we inherit understand accountability and what that means to us, um, how the traditions that we inherit understand healing and what that means to us and, and looking forward to that um, as a time of mutual discovery. So I'm gonna actually go in the same um, invitation that I, um, just to get us started. I'm also hoping that as each of us answers a question um, we're going to first focus on accountability as our theme, and we may be, yeah, depending on how long everybody talks, uh, we may have time to talk to each other about accountability. But go, Paul. Let me begin with you and ask: How could you could you speak to how accountability is understood in your tradition, um, and how that relates to your work? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Nuria. Yeah, I think in, within the Hindu tradition, um, there's a there's a strong sense of individual accountability and responsibility. People are responsible for the actions they take um, and are held accountable to those in, in various ways. And if you look at um, one of the main Hindu texts, um, the Bhagavad Gita, which is spoken by Krishna, um, at the end of the text, Krishna is, 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 throughout the text, he is instructing his friend and his disciple on how to lead a good life and how to act in various situations. And right at the end, one of the final closing verses of the 700 verses, he says to his friend, I have told you everything you need to know, but now you have to make the decision yourself about what you think is the right thing to do. And so Hinduism is less prescriptive, but more about, I'm gonna give you options and you have to decide what the right option is for you, given your own intellect, your level of understanding of a situation and where you are in your life and what your goals are. And so everybody has a path, everybody has a journey and everybody has to discern what the right thing for them for themselves to do is. And so that's, so in that sense, that's why the responsibility is there on the individual, because we can't blame other people. You know, we can't say, oh, the leaders told us to do this or society is pushing us in a certain direction. We all have free will and we all have to exercise that according to our best ability. And so the way, the way that that plays into the work we do mobilizing Hindus for climate action is that we're not prescriptive. We say this is the problem based on science and tradition. And these are the solutions based on science and tradition. And now you as an individual, as a community, as a, as a temple or, or, or a household have to decide what is the best thing that you can do right now to make a positive contribution to this problem of climate change. And we'll offer solutions and we'll offer support and um, community and resources, whatever you need, but we're just offering you the options on the table and you have to decide. And by doing that, we find it makes people feel accountable to the decisions they make, but it also empowers them that they've made a conscious decision about what they want to do. Um, and what we really try to avoid is any narratives around fear or judgment, that if you don't do this, the world is gonna burn down, or if you do this, God is going to judge you or the community will look upon you badly. We know that fear and judgment-based narratives in the climate space aren't working. And so that's why we lean strongly into uh, narratives that are based on science and tradition, but give people the free will and the, um, the option to make the choices that, that work best for them, given the current context. I, I'm just like biting my tongue instead of, because I have so many follow-up questions, but that would be not helpful. Um, Nathan, I'd like to invite you, if you would speak to um, how accountability is understood in your tradition, how that relates to your work. Thank you, and thanks for the great answer, Gopal. Um, well, this is very much a small nutshell answer, um, but a couple ideas from the Buddhist tradition that come about are one, collective karma. Um, karma is a word that literally means action, but in the Buddhist tradition, especially intentional action, um, our intent is what matters most. And um, this is not something that happens 
outside only on our own. It's fully interconnected with all the intentional actions going on around us. So there is both a very deep sense of responsibility towards other beings around us and a sense of how we are all in this giant interplay together. Um, and one other key concept I would mention is the emphasis of both compassion and wisdom acting together and the need to balance these both very carefully. Um, if compassion is wonderful and we need that to act in the world, but we have to also do it in a wise way and develop the wisdom and knowledge um, to make sure that it's done properly. Otherwise, <laughs> there's a phrase that some, some Buddhists say called stupid compassion, um, where we can act with good intention, but it may not actually be helpful to the people we're intending to help. Um, so we need to balance these two sides very carefully. Um, it, as far as doing that actual action in the world and some of the realistic things um, related to my own work, um, in these um, areas of disaster care and crisis care, although I've mostly been working out of Japan, in the American context too, there are a number of great organizations um, doing work on the interfaith level as well. And um, I think that can be really good, not just to look into when you really need it, but speaking of the wisdom and preparedness, um, if communities are interested, it can be very good to look beforehand and be prepared for crises to happen. Um, and so uh, some organizations that communities of faith can get involved in, for example, are the National Volunteer Organizations Active in Disaster, um, VOAD or NVOAD, uh, which includes a lot of spiritual care guidelines for faith communities. Um, they have a whole book, small book called Light Our Way, which is a guide to spiritual care in times of disaster. Um, and special spiritual care sets of guidelines, uh, which are really useful for faith communities to go over even in times of non-crisis um, so that you're prepared when anything might happen. Um, a couple other organizations are the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation. Um, some of these I think are listed now in the um, chat box. Uh, this includes uh, special guides for spiritual crisis intervention that faith communities can use um, and the American Red Cross as well. Um, they also have a number of uh, guidelines for different communities and you can even become um, a, an area uh, that will receive special materials from the Red Cross ahead of time uh, in order to be a shelter in advance of any crisis that might occur at some point in time uh, so that your community is prepared to handle um, any of the victims and survivors in both a wise and compassionate type of way. Thank you. And it sounds like compa um, the compassion and disaster, the accountability that you experience is, um, is related to being there for others in their time of need. Right. Um, and I would say, <laughs> in addition to that, it's really important to consistently check in with the people on their own needs, not make assumptions about them, um, which listening skills are really, really important in this line of work. Thank you. I'm going to, um, I'm going to transition to Huda and ask Huda, could you speak to how accountability is understood in your tradition, how that relates to your work? 
Yeah, so I'll start first saying that, that Wisconsin Green Muslims work is guided and inspired by the sacred teachings from the Quran, the holy book for Muslims, and the hadith reports on the sayings and traditions of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, because I'm going to re reference them in my uh, remarks. So as we are uh, experiencing uh, Ramadan, it is time for spiritual self-accountability and healing together with repentance, reflection, restoration, and renewal of the body and the soul. Accountability is one of the core issues of Islam. Everyone is responsible for their work and is accountable for that. Allah, God, did not create us without any purpose. Among the purposes, two Quranic ayat verses reveal that we are created as the Khalifa, viceroys, and for worshiping God alone. Uh, besides our duties to our Lord, uh, Allah, we are also responsible for others, such as for ourselves and for all life. These are not merely our responsibility only, but we are accountable for that. It means we will be asked for each and every action we act in this worldly life. The accountability is in both worlds, in this worldly life and in the life hereafter. Accountability in Islam derives from the concept of amana, trust. God says in the Quran, chapter 33, verse 72, Indeed, we offered the trust to the heavens and the earth and the mountains, and they declined to bear it and feared it, but man undertook it to bear it. Indeed, he was unjust and ignorant. So it's a huge responsibility um, to be accountable for uh, for all all beings, all life, and um, because uh, that's yeah, that's what it is. But then there's this um, narration from the prophet, peace be upon him, who said that we will be uh, asked uh, by God about five things. First is how we lived our life. Second is how we utilized our youth. Third is how or what means did we earn our wealth? And then fourth, how did we spend our wealth? And then fifth, what did we do with our knowledge? So all these will be accountable for. So again, accountability is central to our faith. Thank you. The, speci the specificity of that, those questions just really stands out to me. I also want to take a brief moment to just invite any participants. As questions are arising for you, as people are speaking um, their reflections, please feel free to send them into the chat. Um, they, will get, they will get to me, and I will get them to our panelists. So I just want to make sure everyone that's watching and listening is invited to do that. Frank, would you be kind enough to talk to us about how accountability is understood in your tradition, how it relates to your work? Well, I have to start with a, with a story, and that's about the times of, of treaty times, when, uh, you know, when my ancestors were negotiating treaties with the United States. Uh, one of the things, and, and it's just as one example, I'll use fishing, we reserved the rights to fish. And as we've had to protect those rights in the courts and, and all of, and other places as we exercise them, the courts have interpreted that as a property right. But there's a thing called the canons of construction that talk about how treaties are to be interpreted. And that's a court doctrine. And in that, how they're to be interpreted is the way the Indians would have thought of them at the time they were made, rather than the way attorneys might parse those words today. And so what did my ancestors mean when they reserved the right to fish? They didn't look at the water and say, those are our fish. Rather, they looked at the water and, and they, they said, we reserve the right to fish. What does that mean? It means the right to sing for the fish, to pray for the fish, to dance for the fish, to catch and eat the fish, but to have a, a relationship with fish. It's that relationship that's the actual treaty right. That relationship with the fish is what's critical to us. And the point is, we're accountable in the way that we do that relationship. If we do things that harm the fish, well, we're harming ourselves. 
And if we do things that help the fish, we're helping ourselves and we're helping the rest of the world. Well, this is that same thought because it's not just fish, it's the water, it's the land, it's all of the beings that we share this creation with. And it's also the night sky, the stars, all of, all of the cosmos is part of this. And so that whole idea about being accountable and, and you know, we are, we are to, we're in a, we're a part of a family in creation of all of the beings and that we have this respect for each other. And it's when we have lack of respect, that leads us to being out of balance. And when we're out of balance, we have to try to find a way to restore that balance, restore that harmony. And, uh, and we also, because we can't, we can't help our fish to be healthy, the fish that we're going to be live with, the fish that we catch, we can't have those fish be healthy and not have everybody's fish be healthy. So that means we have to work on keeping the environment clean for all fish. And climate change is a really big factor in all this. So there's a lot of issues that go on here, uh, but the idea that we are, we're all accountable, not just to ourselves and our families, but to all of creation. That's the way that we view accountability. Thank you. I, I'm um, torn between wanting to move to the healing questions and also <laughs> recognizing that I have some words that I should probably say about my tradition. Um, and it's interesting, I reflect back on just the sermon that I preached this morning, you know, like 20 feet, uh, probably more than that in that direction. Uh, because what in it I said two different things. One of the things that I said this morning was that European Christians, um, the descendants of European Christians, um, need to be repentant and uh, recognize that we are accountable um, in this time for the decisions that our ancestors made. Um, the, the ancestors 500 years ago who thought um, leaving Europe that they had the right to dominate, control, and subjugate other peoples, and that, that they thought that, that God had given them that right. Um, and I said in my sermon that that was sin, which I, that's the use of, that's the Christian theological term for what that was. Um, and as well, I, I also said this morning that we are uh, beloved, we are God's children now, what we will be has not been revealed, which was a sentence from the scripture reading that we had. And I uh, said, um, we are God's children no more or no less than any other being on this planet. Um, and what we will be has not yet been revealed in the sense that it's still a mystery how few the future is going to unfold. Um, as Christians, we are baptized into the body of Christ um, and it's our belief that um, all things were made in and through Christ, and in Christ all things cohere, all things hold together. And with that in mind, um, we are accountable for the well-being of ourselves and for other beings, but we also need to be accountable for the fact that we inherit traditions that have done damage, including damage to the climate um, and then damage to other peoples. So, um, so that's what I'm working on as a Christian, and um, that's a little bit about how I think about accountability um, and as an inheritor of what I, I consider to be a tradition that is an incredible blessing to me and a one that I chose, but also a tradition that has been um, complicit in great damage. So moving from that, I would like to um, invite others to think about how healing is understood. Uh, <laughs> I think actually I did a nice segue there. <laughs> um, so um, I, I'll I've been calling on people in the same order, um, so I'm going to mix it up and I'll go backwards. So, Frank, I would like to invite you, if you would, to, to um, begin our thoughts, uh, uh, speak to how healing is understood in your tradition and in your work, which I think you started with that already, actually, but give us a little more. Well, uh, you know, we think of, uh, I, I'll, I'll describe just what happened just yesterday, for instance. Uh, we, in our community here, we have a we have a celebration in the spring called the Re we celebrate the return of the thunders and this happens uh, usually in april usually about the third weekend of april and we we light a sacred fire we do pipe ceremonies and we offer prayers thanking those thunders for coming and the thunders represent the they help keep the balance that you know the the thunder beings help keep the balance between the earth and the sky and that if you think about it that's sort of supported by the by science and that it's it is literally keeping the balance and in, in charge between the sky and the earth but we actually appreciate that and so we do this every year and in that we offer prayers 
And so when we talk about healing, as we pray there, we're praying for, for healing. And when we pray for healing, we pray for healing for our families, for our individuals, for the, we go around the, the, the four directions that in that we think of it in, as the East is, is, is the, is infancy. And we pray for all those infants that are here and those yet to come. And the South is, is the youth and that's summer. And we think of that and we talk about it, you know, them getting the guidance they need as they grow and us applying good homes. And then that Western direction is autumn and that's the, that's middle age. That's when we're raising our families and, and uh, you know, we're praying for, for all those that are in that providing homes for the, for the youth and, and doing the things that are necessary to keep food on the table, keep a, keep a structure over our heads. And then that Northern direction is, is winter and that Northern direction is, the, is elderhood. And it's that idea that there's a, uh, you know, that that's the time of storytelling, the snow on your hair when you have hair, you know, <laughs> and all of these things. But, but the idea is that the elders and the youth are holding hands in that eastern direction, the elders and the infants, and that keeps that circle of life going. And that for us, it's that circle of life. And so when we talk about healing, whenever you're out of balance, there's teachings that go with all four of these directions. And we're taught that we should be standing in the middle of the world, not too far down any one of those directions. Because if we go, if we go too far down, that we work out in the gym every day, three times a day, and we're out there doing all this, we're probably not doing the, th the things we need in other parts of our life. And that'll pull us out of balance. But we need to do everything in balance and try to be standing in the middle of the world like that. And so healing is trying to restore that balance. And we do that through different medicines, different herbs that are, were gathered to, uh, and, and through different practices, through dance, through, through prayer. But all of those things, the goal for healing is to try to restore the balance. Thank you. Um, Huda, I, may I invite you? Yeah, definitely balance is a key concept in Islam. And uh, I mean, it's all, it's, it's called the Mizan in Arabic. So that's, you can see it over and over there. It's definitely. And I would uh, mention Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is reported to have said, if doomsday is about to take place, while any one of us has a tree sapling in our hand, which we can cultivate, then cultivate it for we will be rewarded. So this message of active hope and healing inspires me and motivates me to plant and tend to the garden of life. Personally, I strive to seek the light in the midst of every dark and difficult situation, including this time of climate emergency. And many, many of us have wounds that stem from the labors of our environmental and climate justice work that are in desperate need of healing. We must ask each other, how are you healing? And then listen to and learn from each other through a process of appreciative listening. We need to chart paths of healing rooted in our unique identities, backgrounds, traditions, cultures, religions, experiences, ancestor stories, wisdom, practices, and teachings. Through a collaborative work with women of color uh, nationally, we asked how to be healers for our wounds and the wounds of others in the climate justice movement. How as wounded healers can we learn from the healers of the world and be ourselves effective healers? During COVID-19 social distancing, health and economic crisis, we emphasize the message, welcome friend, you're not alone. To overcome social isolation, we held online conversations around the powerful concept of wounded healers, honoring the gifts we each have. And then through Wisconsin Green Muslims Interfaith Initiatives, Faith for Rainwater Harvesting or Farah, which means joy, and the Faith Communities for Equitable Solar, which connects with over 6,000 Wisconsinites from 18 different faith traditions and spiritualities and backgrounds, 
we center the healing power of sunlight and rainwater as sacred gifts and trusts that gently touch the heart and open the mind with love, light, and power. Thank you. Um, Nathan, I, I, as soon as we finish these, uh, I'm going to invite you to share what um, stood out to you from each other's thoughts or what questions you may have for each other. So just be knowing that, but I want to make sure everybody speaks. Um, Nathan, uh, could you talk to us about how healing is understood in your tradition? Sure, thanks. Um, first of all, one of the main aims of Buddhism, what it really boils down to is eliminating stress and suffering. And so healing is a really core component of that in so many ways. Um, it, one of the most fundamental teachings in Buddhism is called the Four Noble Truths. Um, and I, I think often in the West, this is mostly understood philosophically, but it's actually very integrated into the practice as well. And so these four noble truths, the first one is dukkha, which is the stress and suffering itself. Um, but each of these has a duty or a task and action to go with it. And so in this first one, I, the task is to examine it fully, uh, understand it as fully as you can. Um, so once you identify the point of suffering or stress, you look at it, you don't hide away from it and try to really fully get to the bottom of what is causing it. Um, so that literally leads to the second noble truth, which is the origin of suffering. Um, the, the origin of suffering has the task to abandon that origin, overcome that origin. So you try to find the ways in which you can transcend, overcome, um, get rid of that root cause of the suffering itself. Um, so then the third noble truth is the cessation of stress. And again, these flow right together. Um, so with this one, you also kind of abide within it, I experience it, I take note of the differences between the suffering and the feeling of freedom from that. Uh, once you've transcended the root causes, um, and then you go into the path, which um, the fourth noble truth and the task of this one is to practice it. Now, of course, the talk about the, the path is very, very um, long and complex, much more time than we have here. But um, in general, all of these four together work as a really positive feedback loop. So by the time you come back to the path and you're more focused again, you have more awareness about and build awareness uh, that helps you detect and uh, bring attention to other aspects of suffering and stress that might be around. And then you can go through these whole four steps again um, repeatedly in different ways. And so the more you deal with the suffering, um, the greater your attention can be to other aspects that are around. Uh, and so this is a sort of general framework of going through a, the healing process uh, on many different levels. Um, uh, just as far as a couple practical examples though of healing and Buddhism related to uh, some of my work. I, uh, one modern priest that I worked a little with, his name is Oshda Dayan, um, and he is a certified music therapist, but um, 
is taking some of these visualizations and contemplative traditions along with the traditional chanting styles and combining these together into a sort of chanting meditative therapy, um, both with cancer patients and disaster victims um, to help in their healing process and trauma recovery. Uh, another organization I did a fair amount of work with is called Cafe de Monku, which is a little play on words because in Japanese, Monku means to complain, but it also means in English, monk. Um, so it is a place where um, people who've just suffered from some recent natural disaster or other kinds of disasters, uh, they can come in at their leisure, um, drink coffee, tea, eat the free snacks, um, but if they feel the need, they can complain to the monks uh, about the experiences in their lives. <laughs> and so it, the volunteers are all on hand to, just as people need um, to listen to their stories, be with them and um, kind of be that presence um, as people go through the healing processes. Thank you. Um, go, Paul, let me invite you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I kind of feel like everything's already been said um, by, by Frank, Nathan, and, and, and Huda, but just to um, you know, just give a little Hindu spin on, on it, um, you know, we, we very much um, are in alignment with this understanding that, um, that the balance needs to be restored. Um, as Frank was saying, and in, in the Sanskrit um, from, the, from the Rig Veda, the term is called Ritta, R-T-A. And that's, uh, what, that's actually the first philosophical concept in Hinduism is that there is a cosmic order or a cosmic balance. And um, the role of a human or the role of us as people is to maintain that cosmic order and balance. And by behaving in ways that aren't helpful, we distort that balance and then therefore healing needs to take place. Um, so very much, um, I mean, you know, always appreciating what Frank, Frank has to say. Um, and in terms of the actual act of healing, I think Hinduism places focus on two things. One is, one is of being humble and to ask for forgiveness. Um, humble in the sense that recognizing that everybody falls short. Um, no individual or community is perfect throughout time. You know, obviously we have to recognize injustice where it has taken place and work to rectify that, but recognize where can I improve? How can I be better? How can my community, my tradition be better, show up in a more um, stronger way to help the cause, to help other people who are suffering? So humility is needed from a Hindu perspective for healing. And then forgiveness. Um, we can't heal if we can't forgive. And again, recognizing that we're all human, we all fall short from time to time. And so needing to forgive others in order to move beyond the past injustices in a way that heals because if we, harbor, if we harbor ill feelings in Hinduism, it's understood that healing can't take place because you have to heal your heart. And by healing your heart, you have to be able to say, I recognize the injustice that we're causing to the land or to other people, but how can we move forward together? And I remember, not I remember, but I, I hear the story of Mahatma Gandhi when he was in the, in the freedom struggle against the British and the people around him really wanted to be very retaliatory towards the British. And Gandhi said, no, we want them, they came and we want them to leave as friends. We don't want them to leave in a, with a bad mood or with antagonism towards India when, when the British do finally leave. And I love that idea that although the British did so much damage to India, but still Gandhi with his, magnum, with his um, spiritual roots said, no, we still have to treat them as friends and we have to make sure they leave as friends. And so when it comes to the earth, recognizing that we are causing damage to the earth, recognizing that we all fall short at some points in our lives and that we have to be, have that humility to recognize that, forgive those who are doing wrong and see how we can work together. I mean, I think that's the spirit of the conversation here today is that like no, from a Hindu perspective, no tradition, no peoples have a monopoly on the truth. Um, that we have to work together in a collaborative way in order to find the solutions for, for the current environmental concerns. So I think that's really how, the, how a Hindu um, approach would be around healing and, and reconciling the challenges we have around climate change. 
as I suspected, our time is growing short just as we've reflected on these two questions. And I would um, just briefly add, you know, at its best, Christianity is a religion of love and forgiveness. Um, the, it, the, the commandments that we receive from Jesus are to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And it, when we see our life as a creature, um, to recognize that God in, in our origin stories, um, Genesis chapter 2, human beings are shaped from soil and breathed into the, the breath of life goes into them from God's breath. And I continually come back to that as a concept for healing to recognize um, that I am dust and to dust I will return um, and that I made one with creation and uh, been breath breathed into with God's breath. And that is true for anyone who breathes, that God has also breathed breath into you and to your ancestors and made, you know, that's how, uh, I think that's important for healing our relationships with each other and with the planet to have um, that gift from the tradition that I, that I come from. So we have a couple um, questions in the chat and we also have the opportunity to reflect with one another on what we've heard today. Let me read uh, the questions from the chat. I'm, I'm really like, we, we have, oh, eight minutes. So I kind of like want to let anybody, people do whatever you want in this eight minutes. Um, the questions that we have, uh, what is the best way to serve as an ally to those marginalized or BIPOC communities who are suffering most from climate change? Um, so how and how is what does allyship look like in your eyes is one question. And then another question is, um, how do these traditions guard against the risk of dogmatizing climate change, which sometimes seems to be an unquestionable dogma. Um, in other words, guarding against creating idols. And I, I don't fully understand this question, I must confess, but it seems like the questioner may be concerned that climate change itself can become a religion um, or an idol of some kind. So if you want to speak to that. Um, but also, I want to invite this time for you to, um, what did you notice about one another's um, reflections on accountability and healing? What stood out to you or what questions do you have for one another? You know, I, I will, uh, I'll take that, I'll go first on that one. And, you know, what I was noticing is that, is that, each of each of us were talking about texts or teachings, and those those uh, those that that knowledge uh, becomes tools that we can self-analyze and work on our own development, work on our own strengths. Because no one is perfect, but we all strive towards that that those goals. We strive toward being better people, and that these are helpful in terms of how we do that. And I, I saw some very similar, very similar things in, in everybody's uh, comments. I thought that that's one uh, observation I had about everyone. And uh, you know, I, I'll leave the questions alone at the moment and let other people uh, comment. I, I, I can... Um echo definitely what Frank's saying. And on, on, the, on this question of allyship, <clears throat> I think it's interesting. I think, I think the first thing that we can all do is just listen, <laughs> just listen. I think we're so um, keen to like do something practical and like, oh, we have to go and do this or have to go and do that, but just listen and understand. I think if, if we could listen more, and I think as faith traditions, as, as spiritual caregivers, I think we all are trained in that in various ways. I think to listen to other histories, other narratives, other approaches can really help us understand where people are coming from. And I think that's probably the most important thing we can do before we actually move into action. I, I find a Western approach is often act first, think later. Um, and I, I find, you know, that's got the West into a lot of trouble, you know, over the centuries, you know, so let's, let's just pause, let's listen to people. And then let's make an informed decision about how we can actually show up. And that may be actually not doing anything. You know, you can be an ally by actually just letting people deal with it themselves in a way that empowers them rather than trying to be a savior and to kind of be there with them. You know, it's it's okay to like not always be there and hold hands with everyone. I think that's that's something I would say. Uh, for an ally, I would definitely say let people speak for themselves. And we have, uh, I mean, we have the uh, principles of environmental justice, 
which by the way, this year we are celebrating 30 years of those uh, principles that were drafted in 1991. And so just honoring those principles, listening to the people who wrote those principles and seeing where we are in 30 years now. And um, yeah, and, and we have this method that we are practicing, which is appreciative listening and uh, just just listening to, to each other and uh, without interruption, without, <laughs> without commenting. Um, so that's critical um, to just listen and appreciate. Um, so on the question of dogma and challenging dogma, at least from the Buddhist tradition, um, one of the more famous uh, resources is a discourse, a sutra called the Kalama Sutra, which um, in there the Buddha literally instructs people um, not just to straight up accept words and discourses as truth, but to test them for yourself to uh, see, is this really working towards ending stress and suffering? And to be consistently questioning this as you're going through the teachings. Um, although also in there, which a lot of people skip over when talking about this, um, but it also does talk to talk about paying attention to the living moral exemplars, awakened exemplars, and following their examples. Um, so looking to people who um, appear to be great at living out the tradition and practice as well. Um, on allyship, I, such a complex question for <laughs> a really short time. Um, but yes, I think the points mentioned is extremely important. Again, listening and paying attention to what are people's needs themselves, not making these assumptions. Um, and related to my area in disaster work, um, crisis care, Marginalized communities are often, of course, the some of the most deeply and harshly affected by natural disasters. Um, so I think there's also a balance that we have to do in different times when, when you are in crisis, it, of course, trying to meet the needs of people in crisis, there are much more critical needs to look for, but in slower times and down times, looking to some of the um, structural violence, deeper embedded cultural violence and things that are incurring and trying to find strategies and ways to both educate yourself and try to find ways to break through these systems, I think is also really important. Uh I would, uh, I'd like to uh, answer one of those questions, a question about ally now, and thinking about that. Uh, I think about the fact that, you know, we talk about environmental justice or climate justice, and there's a lot of people that are working on that, but too often they're only focusing on human populations, not on all populations. And so that idea that we're part of the world is important for us to think about there. And that that, that gets me to the idea about being uh, you know, being a, an ally, often the best way to help somebody else is to make sure that you personally are not doing anything or, or doing less harm. And so the Paris Agreement works because the countries have, are developing nationally determined contributions, NDCs. Well, we need a PDC, a personally determined contribution. What can each and every single individual do that is going to make the world a little better place rather than a little worse? and everybody does that, the world will be a better place. 
And that's been true in all of the things that everybody has said here. And so I, I, I would put that out there, that there ought to be this PDC, a personally determined contribution that we can work towards for climate change, for climate justice, for environmental justice, you know, for human justice and then all of the things that we're doing. Well, I, that, that is um, something that I wish that we could talk more about. Um, at Plain Song Farm is my personally determined contribution, I have to confess. Um, but I am not, we are not going to be able to take that time right now um, because we've reached the end of our hour. I cannot tell you each and all enough um, what a joy it has been to get to know you, even the tiny bits um, that we've had. And now I'm going to um, make a segue to the second hour of the program today. Um, and it's my honor to introduce Sarah King. Um, she's the Director for Environmental and Sustainability Studies and the Associate Professor for Integrative Religious and Intercultural Studies at Grand Valley State University. Sarah is going to be leading the second panel um, and her um, work is connected to the various ways religion and culture shape people's relationships to the natural world, particularly in the present moment. Her research has explored these issues in the food system, in Flint, and in the context of indigenous and settler relations in rural Canada. Before the pandemic, one of her favorite things was being a part of the Interfaith Foodies Group at Kaufman. So as I see that wonderful folks from Kaufman are uh, removing some folks from our panel, um, and they'll also be adding folks to the panel that Sarah is moderating, I just want to say again what an honor it was to be part of this and turn it over to you. Thanks, Maria. And thanks, everyone, on that first panel. This is a great way um, to be in conversation together on a Sunday afternoon in springtime. It's lovely. Um, our conversation really is happening in two parts. So the first part of the conversation that we've all just enjoyed is really about um, principles and ideas and, and what guides us in, in the work of responding to the climate crisis. And now I have the pleasure of hosting uh, at the second part of the conversation where we really wanna talk about uh, the practice of taking action, what that means, uh, what's possible, what kinds of challenges we face. And so it's my pleasure to um, facilitate a conversation amongst three folks who are really leading some of this work here in Michigan. So I'm gonna take a minute and uh, introduce the other people who are here in the panel today. And I wanna say a little bit also about the uh, process that we've talked about following together, um, and then we'll move into some questions and conversation for this second hour. So it's my pleasure first to introduce Hannah Huggett. Uh, Hannah is Hannah's really interested in climate and racial justice, and, and Hannah is one of the leaders of the Sunrise Movement. Sunrise is a national youth-led movement to stop climate change and build a green economy. Um, Hannah believes all theories must be questioned and that striving towards human unity is a constant goal, uh, which we can hold up um, if we hold a compassionate model of love and justice. And they round out their commitment to change making with a personal love of nature, writing, music, and people. And um, they said uh, something that stood out to me, which was my relationships to these things and to myself have taught me the most in life. So um, Hannah and all of our panelists really are doing all of the things that are happening in this conversation um, in the first half and the second half, right? We're just holding up different things in each moment. The second person um, I have the pleasure of introducing is Ren Hack. Ren has been working as the director of His Own Detroit for almost three years. His Own is the largest faith-based environmental organization in the United States and is building a movement that strengthens Jewish life and contributes to a more environmentally sustainable world for all. Ren grew up on a small farm, small animal farm in southeastern Massachusetts, um, where chickens and turkeys roamed free, and the woods, lakes, and cranberry bogs were her first playground. She has spent a lifetime in the practical work of sustainability, including managing greenhouses, promoting fresh, healthy food, and raising her children, Maggie and Erin. Um, and finally, I'd really um, like to introduce Sabel Shatuk. Shatuk, sorry, Sabel. We were practicing names at the beginning and apparently they got messed up in my head. Um, Sabelle uh, works with M Michigan Interfaith Power and Light to develop Stewards of Hope workshops. And those workshops facilitate congregational efforts to form green teams and put faith into action to care for the environment. 
She's also a founding member of Hope for Creation, which is a grassroots coalition of people of faith in the Kalamazoo area who are supporting climate actions in their congregations and in the wider community. And she's also a professor at Western Michigan University. She has a really interesting new book coming out in just a couple of months, Faith, Hope and Sustainability, The Greening of US Faith Communities, which profiles the practical actions that a number, at least 15 faith communities across the US have been taking to try and engage in environmental action. So thanks to all of you for being here. I'm really looking forward to the conversation that we're gonna have today. We've uh, had the chance to meet and have a little bit of conversation together in advance of this panel. And some of the values that we held up as we were planning for this, I wanna hold up again in this moment. Um, the first is um, that we see this as a conversation and really a continuing conversation that builds on um, what's already been happening for the last hour. And so that means that um, we are gonna try and create time for panelists to engage with one another after each question. Um, because that's where we're starting to find the really fruitful and interesting things. What that means is we're also going to honor a practice that I sometimes call Zoom silence. Uh, sometimes it's important just to take a moment and see who has the next thought or idea to step in with. So that doesn't mean if there's a moment of silence, that doesn't mean any of you has to talk absolutely in the next second, right? And there's no need to be uncomfortable. It'll just take the time that it takes. Um, and I will um, facilitate the process as moderator and also be responsible for some timekeeping um, so that make, we make sure we honor the time of, the, of those of you who've uh, joined us today to listen in and be part of the conversation. So with all of that said, um, I wanna start by offering some opening words for this part of the conversation. And these words actually came to me from an undergraduate, undergraduate student of mine at Grand Valley um, who had a lot of conversations with me about um, how, we manage the, how we manage the emotional toll that the, that the work of addressing the climate crisis can take and how sometimes that can feel difficult. And I think um, that's in fact, those are some of the issues that the last panel was holding up at the end, right? How do we understand the tension between our individual responsibility and the need for collective action? And so my students sent me sections from this uh, new book called A Field Guide to Climate Anxiety by Sarah Jaquette Ray. And um, in the field guide, um, Ms. Ray says the following, the perception that social change happens only on an individual scale creates defeatism. Of course, we cannot solve the problems by ourselves. It's worth checking in occasionally on all the engagement and talent out there what some call asset or capacity mapping, and to gather stories of people succeeding, to surround ourselves with lists of collective achievements. As Adrienne Marie Brown writes, we must let our work be tangible in a way that shows how the work builds over time. And so as a part of this conversation that we're gonna have about actions um, to address climate change, we wanted to start uh, by celebrating some of those successes. And we also thought it would be a good way to get into hearing about the work of each of these fabulous folks that are with us. So Sabelle, I wonder if you would start um, as the first person to answer this question, uh, please tell us about some of your successes. What excites you about your work these days? Thank you, Sarah. And I'd also just like to express my gratitude for all the people involved in creating this wonderful opportunity for conversation. Because um, one of the things we found at Hope for Creation is community is, is actually vital. Um, Hope for Creation, it really began actually back in 2014. Bill McKibben had come and given a talk at Western Michigan University the previous fall. And in 2014, a bunch of the churches that are the old churches around Bronson Park started working together with Temple B'nai Israel and the Kalamazoo College Chapel um, and the Sisters of St. Joseph. And they wanted to organize a shared Lenten series of talks on climate change and faith. People were just so concerned after Bill McKibben's talk. And so we ended up with a sequence of four Monday nights in a row, learning about how climate change would affect Michigan um, and I was one of the speakers invited to talk about my research about what faith communities were doing in response to climate change. And then the fourth evening, 
was this brainstorming about what the people in the Kalamazoo area faith communities could start doing in response to climate change. And that was going to lead to the development of task forces and, and then those groups would go off and, and you know, things would happen, which they did. We formed these great, great groups that were going to do work. But um, the senior pastor at First United Methodist Church commented that for four weeks in a row, we had between 150 and 160 people gathering in the basements of churches to all talk about climate change together. And there was such energy, such energy from all those people in the room. And he thought we should try to keep that going. So Hope for Creation became this planning team that was organizing events to bring in speakers once or twice a year and bring the faith community together to learn about climate change. But we started to notice something. The same people were showing up every time. <laughs> so we'd have between 75 and 100 people. There'd be all this great energy. We were having a good time. But we realized we weren't really teaching anything new. We were just reinforcing the concern and we realized probably the most important thing we were doing was creating an opportunity for people of faith who were worried about climate to gather and to share their concerns, to gain inspiration from each other, to gain moral support from each other, and also um, to start helping each other with their projects. So we shifted our focus more away from those, those big gatherings to smaller gatherings and really providing resources for green teams to get started in congregations and helping people learn from each other and do exciting projects. And that's where we really started to use the resources of Michigan Interfaith Power and Light. Um, so almost all of the houses of worship in the Kalamazoo and Portage area have done energy audits through a program facilitated by Interfaith Power and Light. And some of them have run programs to encourage members to do home audits. And the great thing is those programs when we, when we organize them, it's not that one congregation has to do it alone. People from other congregations hear about it and come and participate too. So the impact goes wider. And we've also learned so much from each other. So when Westminster Presbyterian Church installed solar panels, I belong to People's Church, which is Unitarian Universalist Church. And we immediately asked how they did it. And then um, we reached out to the same solar installer and an, a lawyer from Westminster Presbyterian who had helped them with their contract with the solar installer volunteered to come and help People's Church also develop a contract that would really work well. And so then we end up with two churches that have solar panels. And so we have this, this network that is, is really leading to the work. And so what we've realized is in order to do the work, we first had to create the community. And the community then provides the foundation for opportunities to do the work that we want to do to actually change our community, change our congregations, and change our personal lives. Thank you. That's such an exciting way to start. Ren, I wonder if you'd be willing to continue, and then Hannah, um, you can go after that. Thank you, Sarah. And Seibel, thank you for, for the wonderful work that's being done in your community. Uh, I would say for us and at Hazone Detroit, um, we have been here in, in the Detroit area for over five years, so we are a national organization that's uh, coming into our 20th year. The, we were on an incredible trajectory. We were doing wonderful work within our community. We had our seal of sustainability program that has, it has now 30 organizations. Uh, similar to what's being done with the Hope for Creation in that we support organizations and congregations to become greener and we provide them with, uh, with grants and whatnot. We were, we were doing wonderful planting of gardens and, and rain gardens and uh, so much work and then COVID hit. And we had, our, we had our whole year planned out. It was one of our rare years that we actually knew what we were going to do. Our plan was set. We, you know, that, those wonderful strategic plans that we all aspire to, we had it. COVID hit. And we ended up having to very quickly pivot from sustainability, environmental sustainability, to sustain, sustainability of life. 
And so what we did is we began working with warehouses in Detroit, box stores, food production companies, taking their overages, they had no place for it to go, and bring, getting it to those who were in need. And ultimately what we discovered, um, again, we were, we were merely responding. We did not have a plan of any kind that would have been wonderful, helpful. Um, but what we discovered is we were able to actually be mission aligned in this work in that we were diverting food from land that would have otherwise gone into landfills because there, there was no place for this food to go that had been set up, there was no plan. And we were able to get it to those in need. Ultimately, that, that um, amounted to over 466,000 pounds of food that was actually diverted and brought to over 55 different sites. And so that was, it was, it was wonderful. It was, as I mentioned, mission aligned, but it was really hard because it did not feel like we were, you know, where, where's the environment in this? And at the same time, we were also watching the environmental issues be put on the back burner. And it, it, they needed to be because life was taking, was paramount. Um, but fortunately now we're, where spring is spring, uh, springing, <laughs> sprunging. Um, and the hope is um, that we can get back to reminding people of the, of the environment, move forward in different ways. We speak of not going back, but of taking what we have learned in this pandemic period and going, going forward. So we're, we're excited about the future and uh, in future questions, I'll, uh, I'll talk about that. But um, that's, that's, that was a huge success for us and one, one we had not planned on and did not have that wonderful strategic plan. But ultimately that's opportunities arise and you rise with it. Before I answer that, I just want to take a moment to thank the Kaufman Interfaith Institute uh, for giving me the opportunity to be here. And I want to thank Sarah uh, for being our moderator today. Um, yeah, Seibel and Ren, your successes are amazing. I admire them so much. I'm only 16 and as a youth activist, you know, I haven't really had that scope of experience. Um, but yeah, it's, it's lovely to hear um, all the wonderful work you're doing. Uh, so for me, uh, my successes, I, I would say, can be categorized into a framework that we use within Holland's chapter of the Sunrise Movement. So it's the idea that action can happen on the individual, communal, and corporate levels. Um, on the individual level, I would say my successes have included all of the lessons that I've learned in how to be a better organizer and public speaker. Um, I've become more educated specifically over the past two years about racism in America, the traumas of oppression, and and its violent history. That's become integrated into my environmental work because of the vitally important integration between environmental justice and racial equity in environmental racism. Um, these individual successes are then able to reflect for me onto the communal level. So a lot of the action that I've taken on the communal level has to do with mobilizing the community either to become more educated about the climate crisis so that community members will later be more receptive to our calls for climate action or it's to directly mobilize. I've organized events that involve volunteering, such as organizing a massive recycling effort for tulip time in 2019. Um, I've organized several community education events. Um, the most powerful, I think, was one that I did on reversing the plastics crisis, which I hosted for local government leaders across Michigan to attend. And I made the ask that they sign on to a letter, which was addressed to Representative James Lower, who's also chair of the House Local Government Committee. Um, and we were demanding that he bring to a vote a piece of legislation regarding the plastics. Um, last year, I also taught a two-part class on environmental justice through a racial equity lens um, and organized a composting program for Black River Public School. I've done some work with frameworks, which it would be interesting if I can find um, another avenue to talk about this later, but frameworks can, I've, I've found can be really powerful in communities um, because if you have 
that basic plan and you get kind of that foundational groundwork done, then municipalities, schools, whichever it's directed at, um, everywhere potentially um, across the state, across the nation can use that sort of framework to implement the same thing that you did with obvious stipulations depending on the uniqueness of the community. Um, but I've developed two frameworks, one for any school that wants to use it to develop their own composting program and the other one for any municipality to develop their own community energy plan. Uh, more recently with Sunrise, I became the hub coordinator of the Holland Sunrise Hub in February. Um, and I've been more able to use that to work within the corporate dimension of action. We're currently organizing a two part action toward the Holland City Council and demanding that they schedule a vote on their agenda for May 5th on voting on this piece of legislation, which is called a resolution um, to declare a climate emergency. So that will probably involve mobilizing the volunteers and then potentially doing this mass sit in protest should they not uh, schedule this vote. So um, yeah, that's kind of a summary of how I categorize and what the work has been for me. I'm sorry, I have to step in. Hannah, you may think that Seibel and I have like, you know, done so much, but I'm sorry, like <laughs> you, you are young, yet you are so incredibly powerful. So we, we are all on the same level of what we have, what we, the, the greatness that we have done. So Thank you so much. Hello, by any means. Sarah, back to you. <laughs> no, this is a moment for exactly that. I wonder if there are other things you notice, um, questions you have or threads you wanna pull about the connections here before I move the conversation along. I would just mention, um, reach out to some of the faculty and um, there's a Balmer Prettinger who teaches at Hope College. He might be able to organize some people in the faith community to help support that resolution because he's been teaching about faith-based climate action for a while. And he's got extensive connections in the Christian reformed community, which is large up there. <laughs> yeah, I know him actually. Thank you for that connection. One of the things I noticed as I listened is that talking about our uh, talking about success is never separate from talking about the challenges uh, that we face as we think about doing this work of taking action, right? And so I want to um, take a moment to hold that up too. Uh, what could you share with us about the challenges that you're grappling with in this moment? Um, Ren, would you be willing to start? Sure. I'll start with like, what challenges have we not been grappling with at this, at, during this period? Um, th this is a, a unique period in history and with it has, has brought so many challenges. I think hazon, uh, which interestingly means vision in Hebrew, has had to vision our way through so many challenges whether it was, how are we going to move pallets of food? How are we going to face the inequities within our communities, whether it be racial injustice, injustice economic injustice, uh, availability of food? Um, and, and also, how do we, the challenge of, of doing our work in a period of grief, um, people were, were literally losing family members and buildings were closed and um, Seibel had talked about Michigan Interfaith Power and Life, which has been a huge resource that we've used over and over again. And yet it was difficult to communicate with our organizations because they weren't in their buildings and there were no energy audits happening because nobody was around yet. Ultimately, things did happen. I think at first everything needed to like literally shut down just like you know the state did. And then things began to you know sprout a bit. But the, ch the challenges were uh, have been incredible. And I think the ch uh, one big challenge is how do we as individuals who are working in this in this field, how do we keep positive? In you know, in a, in a very difficult period, um, for so many of us, in many ways, our works were put on pause, and um, psychologically, working with people who have lives have been put on pause. 
How do you how do you begin communicating with that? We can't we can't just go back to talking the way we were. So, yeah, to me the challenges are as we say opportunities are numerous. So that's what I'll say. Hannah, are you willing to chime in? Yes. Uh, so I resonate, I think, with a lot of what Ren, what you were saying about um, the challenges of COVID-19, particularly psychologically. Um, as I think about this, I, I guess I would tend to think of it in terms of two categories. Um, in my mind, I definitely tend to categorize things and it's how I process, but um, to break it down just into two and summarize, the first one would be kind of the technical challenges category. Um, some of the more technical challenges which I grapple with include the fact that first, there has to be a constant balance between cooperating with our authority figures and local and state government leaders versus using moral protests to assert our demands as youth to to be heard and to have our voices be credible. Um, another challenge is how to motivate people. As a movement leader, it's so vital to be inspiring, to be engaging, to kind of be able to fill a meeting space with energy and be thoroughly informed on all of the topics. I think there are so many people, youth specifically, uh, who want to be involved, but they're understandably not so interested in the committee process through which a lot of change happens on the local government level. Um, youth also struggle to be involved because of the ideology of defeatism that you mentioned earlier, Sarah, um, which is often perpetuated actually through the media. Uh, and we see that. So a lot of youth don't realize the power of their voice and, um, and with that constant re-perpetuation, it's something that you can't just, you, well, I should say you have to actively combat it. If you're a movement leader, you have to act actively combat that defeatism. So for me, it's one of my biggest passions to be able to do that for youth. It's just a lot of pressure to show up as perfectly as I can um, in those movement spaces. Uh, so that's perhaps an emotional challenge which I face along with uh, an emotional challenges is what I would identify as my second category of challenges. Um, and the second one within that would be the idea of trying to accept the circumstances that we're in and then act um, to accept all the facets of this moment, the collective national moment and not run, uh, to be able to not let our fear overpower us and to not stay comfortable ever. And perhaps most importantly, to not let bitterness take over our hearts because it's so difficult to operate within activism if you have that residual emotional bitterness. Um, we, of course, also, I mean, the, the big challenge that always comes to mind right now is the pandemic and how it's changed everything we do. And so last spring, we had all these grand plans. We had some grant money for community gardens, and we were going to develop all these programs and do outreach to low-income neighborhoods. And, and we were going to try to get Nuria Parrish to come and be like the, the key speaker for this big event we were going to, to organize. Um, and you know, then stay home, stay safe. So, um, so we had to pivot and we had to learn how to do Facebook groups and Facebook Live and Zoom gatherings. Um, and it changed the way we did our activities and some of those gardening projects got put on hold. We'll do them this year. But um, in the process, we also, found we could make connections with people further away. So the climate justice folks up in Grand Rapids, we started interact interacting with them. And, um, and we also started, instead of having our small gatherings with all of the local green team people getting together, we would have a, a Zoom panel discussion with people and it would get recorded and then posted to our Facebook page or to our YouTube channel and suddenly instead of just 20 people participating, these are being seen by more people and people we've never heard of in states we've never been to, right? And, and so on the one hand, we've had this real loss of the close relationships and that wonderful energy of being in the room together, but we've also been finding there are some silver linings um, in the way we've had to, to pivot to these alternatives. 
We've also found that because everybody's online, um, we have to think harder about what distinguishes the work we do as faith community-based earth care advocates, as, as people interested in climate justice, specifically from a faith perspective, what distinguishes what we do from all of the other climate action groups in the area? And so we started really emphasizing um, the, the green team emphasis that, but also the opportunity to do things like eco-spirituality workshops or um, rituals through which people can process their grief over the damage that's being done to our beloved planet. And, and then those too can be posted online. So they become an ongoing resource for people. So there's, the challenges have led us to have to think more carefully about what we're offering because the virtual space is more crowded than the physical space was when we were doing this work. Thanks everyone. I, I wanna just um, take a moment to hold up those challenges. And I wonder if there is more um, to be said or uh, responses that you haven't had a chance to make to one another yet. There's just some time to sit with the challenges if you'd like. I think I would, I would offer to my partners and, and to you as well, Sarah, that um, moments of peace and moments of gratitude, moments of cheeriness, um, I think we've, ex we've all experienced all of this, as well as moments of joy. There have been moments of joy in this, in this recent history. Um, and I think it's, it's upon us to, to grab them when we can, to celebrate them, but to also understand what we've gone through. Uh, it's, it's been a bit of a battle. And um, there are some days that we succeed and some days where we just get through it. And, and so I, I, wish, I wish everyone courage. I wish everyone steadfastness and occasional rest in there would be helpful. Yeah, I wonder, Hannah, how do you pace yourself? <laughs> you must be getting toward the end of the semester with all kinds of assignments. How do you pace yourself and find balance? It's a good question. I don't think I do a very good job of it. So I want to be careful what I say, because in case anyone who's listening to this takes recommendation from that, you know, <laughs> um, I think in principle, some of the best ways to pace oneself would be um, to think of first, just the number one fact that in our culture, we are taught to overwork all the time. Even just think about the fact that we talk about saying, we say that we have to have a life work or sorry, a work life balance. <laughs> I mess that up. Um, because it's supposed to be in my mind life work life overwork um yeah sorry i didn't explain that well but um that's i think in principle one of the best things that we can hold at the forefront of our minds um as we consider pacing and then maybe a follow-up to that would just be um choosing to remain in constant clear relationship to ourself that definitely avenues through which clarity in one's relationship to oneself can be achieved include self-care and self-compassion so you know not just the typical self-care routines like physical self-care but that mental and emotional self-care um, because when we practice self-care we're naturally strengthening and clarifying our relationship to ourself and then I would imagine um, our ability to pace ourselves becomes better as a result Let us know in 10 years how you're doing with that, Hannah. And teach us, teach the rest of us, please. I always uh, feel better when I remind myself that life work balance is an aspirational goal. You know, it's a practice. It's not a thing like that I have to hold because, I, because I'm always on one side or the other. And so then when I remember like it's a journey, like all these other things, I feel a little bit better about myself. And periodically, you just have to go out and sit under the maple tree and watch the squirrels and watch the daffodils grow. 
Right. <laughs> so um, the, the question that I bring, the next question that I have is actually a question that was also just at, um, offered to us uh, by someone who's um, watching the webinar right now. Um, and it's a question about um, how we understand the value of individual actions, uh, given that what we're talking about are such huge structural and systemic problems. Um, and so I, uh, I think about it like there's a tension, right? Like on the one hand, I wanna think about changing my own individual behaviors in order to address the climate crisis. But on the other hand that I know, like no matter how many times I remember to use my reusable water bottle, that's not actually going to change um, the climate situation, right? And so the way that the person in our, who's here in our community framed this question, I think is really helpful. What guidance would you offer someone who is overwhelmed by the scope of the climate crisis and believes that, he, at, that his or her or their individual actions cannot possibly make a difference? How do you understand individual actions and systemic actions? And how do you hold up the tension between those two things in your own work? Hannah, would you be willing to start? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I think the place to start for me would just be to define each, if that's OK. So for me, uh, I view individual change as the behaviors and actions we take on on a moment to moment or daily basis, which are in alignment with the common goal. In this case, it's environmental sustainability. Uh, structural change then is more so about recognizing that the attitude you're maintaining in yourself when you take those individual actions is not the same attitude or, or the same positionality, we might say, that was initially used to build the systems that we have today. So the purpose of individual action is about both its actual climate impact in a measured way, since every little bit truly does count, um, but it's also about how it grounds us more on an emotional level um, in a healthy, inclusive transformation oriented mindset that is necessary to then create the structural change. Um, in turn, structural change is where the bulk of the work does have to happen and it's something that we can participate in individually. So I think there's a little bit of hope even in that, knowing that not only does our individual, not only do our individual actions empower us um, to maintain um, an attitude that keeps us in an emotional, emotionally sustainable place, um, but that those individual actions um, then are like one such individual action is to participate in the structural change. Um, so within the structural change, once we get to this level where we're participating in, participating in it individually, um, structural change means that we have to recognize the nature of the systems we have. So our economic, socioeconomic, and governmental systems, to name a few, um, but that we also have to recognize the dysfunction within um, those systems so that we can begin to address it. Uh, structural change means recognizing that our nation was founded on a racist, colonial, imperialist mindset. Um, and we, we as a nation for centuries now have practiced regularly the exploitation of environmental resources and of our most vulnerable communities. Um, so as we look at this, I, I realize that the balance between the individual action that we can take um, as people who don't have, um, you know, as citizens who don't have that power and the privilege of the people um, who are leading the country, um, particularly I think for people without privilege, I think that hopelessness uh, can be so exacerbated because not only um, do you not see any reflection of yourself or not only do you not see your community being kept in mind as we think about policy most of the time, since our leaders, um, it would threaten their privilege to hold those communities at the forefront when thinking about policy. Uh, not only that, but you're also experiencing uh, this idea that you as an individual um, then don't have the means to have that impact as long as those people are in power. Um, so I think a lot of what a lot of the guidance I could offer would just be reach out for support um, because this that emotional experience is something that you're not alone in. Um, again, recognize that the individual action on a literal level does count. Um, and even if it didn't, 
count uh, at all. Um, it's the attitude that you're creating for yourself when you take individual action that helps you when it comes to structural change. And then thirdly, as soon as you become willing to reach out for the support um, and hopefully, you know, start to build that solidarity and connections. Solidarity may come at a high cost, but it's a cost that a growing number of people are becoming more willing in themselves. They're deciding in themselves that it's a cost we're willing to pay. And it's that movement that's going to overturn those structures of power so that we can liberate, um, we can liberate people and we can actually create a sustainable, livable, healthy future. Thank you so much, Hannah. Sabelle, would you uh, have anything to offer on this question? I think it's interesting that in our society, we're always trying to find that silver bullet. Like, what's the one thing to do? Is it voting? Is it not using straws? You know, what's the one thing? And what we really need is to change our way of living from an exploitation mindset to a regeneration mindset so that everything we do is about the health and well being of the ecosystems that are the basis of our thriving and everything around us. So, you know, I like to say, okay, maybe straws aren't important for climate change, but if you walk on the beach of Lake Michigan, you're gonna see a lot of straw fragments. So I don't want those to be polluting my environment. Sustainability, living in a, in a way that honors my relationship with this planet means I need a lot of changes to my behavior. But it's also, okay, climate change. I wanna privilege the things that will make the, di the biggest difference, right? And so we know on the personal side, the three biggest things we can do, fly less, drive less, eat less meat. So Sarah, you and I, we've got the job of trying to persuade our universities that we should not have to fly to conferences every year in order to fulfill our career requirements, right? Because why should we behave in a way that's destroying the world that our students are going to live in? <laughs> um, and and so there, there are these big things we can do that, that can start shifting um, our personal effects, but then of course the system, systemic issues are extraordinary. And so that's where, that's where it's great to be part of a community. So you can say, oh, we need to put pressure on our politicians because there's this great Green New Deal or there's something we really want to promote. Hey, let's go collect signatures at the church, at the synagogue and a place where there's a bunch of people who share our values and then we can get a letter writing campaign and we can actually do that community work to create the system change that needs to happen. So I think it's really important to try to find a balance between the two. Um, I've been known to say that being an environmentalist is about finding the level of hypocrisy you can live with because you can never actually live up to your own ideals. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't keep trying to do a little better and a little better and a little better every year and take inspiration from the people behind around us who, who demonstrate how to do it even better. Now, if we could just get permission not to fly to all those conferences. Ren, um, is this something you have thoughts to offer? Yes, uh, Hazan, especially at our, our national office, two years ago be, began really grappling with this issue. What is it that we can do as individuals? What, what is it that we can do as communities, as organizations? And they created what was called, what's called the Brit Hazan. And Brit is, means covenant. Hazon means vision. And so they created a six step process where over a period of six weeks or a year, you can um, experience a change in your life. Uh, one may be transitioning to a plant rich diet. Another one may be um, reducing your energy use, reducing household waste, um, buy local, grow local buy less um, and 
what we found is by giving people resources and actually Hazon Detroit is doing it a little different. We're actually doing kits where we're providing you with lots of ideas and actually um, opportunities for experience of a plant rich diet or reducing household waste or any of that. And the hope is, is that by the end of the year, six weeks, however long you wish to take to try these out, you actually make a commitment to change. Because we are no longer at the point of like, um, as Seibel said, you know, the, the straws or which we, 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 yes, there's no question, we, we have to stop using straws. It's ridiculous. But we also have to make other changes. And as Hannah speaks out, and, and she, she, said, she said it so much more kindly than I will, we have to shout at this point. We truly have to yell that we are in a global environmental crisis and we have to make change because we cannot live in this. There is no status quo anymore in terms of the environment. The environment is changing in front of our eyes and it is upon us. We are compelled. I mean, for, for us as Jews, we are compelled, obligated to care for the earth. And as we heard from our previous, the previous panel, for those who got to listen to them, the wonderful speakers we had, we, we truly do have to, if, if you're in any way involved in the faith community, we are compelled to make a difference. And I love the story of um, the man who was walking on the beach with littered with starfish. You know, I was going to tell you that one. And uh, someone came upon he came upon a gentleman or we, let's say it's a child throwing starfish back into the sea. And the gentleman says to the child, "Why are you? Why are you doing this? Look about you. The 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 shore is littered with starfish." And he picked up a starfish and he threw it into the ocean and he said, you know, it matters to that one. And that's what we have to know. It matters, any change, any commitment, but also our voice truly matters. And we've got to use our voice. We have got to speak out. So that's what I would, our, our Brit Hazon is, is listed in the resources and uh, it's, they're easy to follow, but it does it does allow, uh, allow us to make change, which is so necessary. One of the things um, I this is so helpful to me. Um, you're, you've covered a lot of ground in just a few minutes. Um, one of the things I think about is that sometimes that focus on the limitations of individual actions is sometimes I think it functions as a way to shut us down, right? The guilt over what each of us can do individually as not being enough means that we think, oh, well, why would I bother? Because what I do is isn't good enough anyways, right? Like if one of the three things that I really need to do is drive less, right? Then, um, but I live in a place where there's not good public transit. I have to drive my car. Well, I'm a terrible person because I drive my car to go to the grocery store then. What if instead you told yourself a different story? What if the story you told yourself was, well, I have to drive my car because there's not good public transit. Maybe we need to change the public transit system. Maybe I'm gonna find the people who I can be allies with to help make those systemic changes that then will allow me to make individual changes that aren't an option for me right now. And that's part of what I think about, about navigating those barriers as I listen to you all um, chatting. I wonder if there are other reflections or thoughts you've had as you're listening to one another um, that before we move on, I can see another couple of questions coming in. But I don't wanna to move too quickly. We have found that, um, I mean, it matters when we can bring the voice of the faith community into the public square to promote the system change. So we, we had letters from Hope for Creation with naming all of the congregations whose members belong to our interfaith group, um, making a statement in support of the Kalamazoo City Commission declaring a climate crisis, and then also at the county level. 
and um, and I, I'm sure you know we were adding to the the cacophony of voices from the town, but because we represent large communities that are the basis of so much of the work that is done in town, I think our voices are heard when we join that conversation because we're so important as donors and um, as people who help with so many of the social safety nets in our community. The City Commission cares what the faith community thinks. As your timekeeper, I would like to let you know that we have about five minutes still of conversation before we move into the wrapping up. And uh, there's one more question that's come in. I, we, we have two questions that have been addressed directly and indirectly by us already, I think. There's a third question here that's um, come in from those who are in the conversation, although we can't see them. And um, somebody has asked, could you give an example of an environmental hero that's inspired your work on behalf of the climate? And I think um, as you think about, you know, what else might need to be said before the end of this conversation, in some ways, uh, this is a great question because it circles us right back around to where we started, right? How do we hold up the important kinds of work that exist in the world? And not only, you know, where we are in Michigan, but where else? Maybe here, maybe here in Michigan, maybe your hero is the person who lives next door to you, right? But maybe your hero is somebody else somewhere in the world who's been thinking about and working on these questions. And please feel free just to chime in if you have some thoughts about how you would answer that. I would have to say, uh, it's, a, it's such an interesting question. And on other topics, it may be easy to come up with a hero. Um, right now I'm thinking of heroes, plural. Uh, I think there are, I have met so many heroes this past year who were receiving rescued food and providing it to those in need. I have met so many or we organizations who in spite of COVID are still working within their buildings to make change or planting gardens or um, putting in, um, we call them bubblers, but uh, fountains that, that also do, you know, bottle fills. They're, they're taking advantage of the downtime to be able to make changes to their buildings. Uh, Greta, of course, is a huge hero um, and she has taken it upon herself. She has changed her life completely to be able to shout from the rooftops and she has immense courage to be going up against world leaders and saying, I'm sorry, um, you're not listening to me. I am, your I am the future and I don't agree with what's going on here. And I think um, the heroes are those that are standing up and demanding change and making change. I would agree that it's very difficult to select just one hero. Um, I love all of the examples that you gave, Ren. One of my personal heroes is actually 13-year-old Mari Kopney. Uh, she's also, well, more commonly known as Little Miss Flint. When the Flint water crisis initially hit, um, she wrote a letter to President Obama telling him about it um, and saying in, in certain terms um, that it was blatantly clear that it was a product of environmental racism. And that letter was actually what prompted him to then visit the community see the damage for himself and then approve $100 million in relief for them. Um, since sending that letter, she's become even more involved. I know she's raised over $500,000 for her Flint Kids project. And um, it's, it's so incredible how at her young age um, and 
yeah, at her young age being black and female, um, she is so empowered and so empowering for, I, I'm sure all of the youth in her community and youth everywhere who see what she's doing um, with her dedication to social justice and environmental justice. Um, I think also another cool thing about her is that she's soon going to become a, a youth ambassador um, to the Women's March. So there's kind of that integration as well um, with equality. Uh, yeah, anyway, I really admire her. Um, for all of those reasons. And I think um, for, for all of us who, particularly those of us who are a bit newer to the environmental movement, one thing I would say uh, to, to that group um, would just be that it's so important that the people we look up to and the people we focus on um, are, we have a diverse view um, and we look at their work and learn from it, how to integrate it into our own lives into our, and into our own work. Because anytime we only see one model of how to do something, one model of how to combat the climate crisis, how to combat a water crisis, how to attack you know, the issues of clean air and water as a couple of examples. Anytime we only see one model or methodology for doing that, um, our entire thinking is then shaped around it. And so role models are really powerful because if we have a diverse um, group of role models that we look up to, our, our climate activism then becomes so much more equitable. Yeah, it's a long list. Um, but one one project that has been particularly impressive to me just recently is uh, the Work For Me DTE campaign led by people like Michelle Martinez and Jamisa Johnson Greer and uh, Teresa Landrum over in Detroit. And basically what they did is stand up to DTE energy and say, no, you are not going to replace the coal plant with another fossil fuel burning plant in our area. We want clean power. And, and so they have successfully um, protested DTE's five, 10 year plan where it's gonna build this giant natural gas plant that's just going to perpetuate climate problems. And they have stood up on the grounds that first of all, it's going to be in their neighborhoods continuing to pollute them with bad air and secondly it's going to continue to cause climate change and on both those grounds it cannot be allowed um, and so they they're changing the discussion around energy for our state on behalf of all of us and all generations to come in really powerful ways and i, I just so appreciate what they're doing Thanks everyone. This is a, um, this seems like a great um, moment to hold up actually lots of successes, right? And it's like um, brave, brave isn't doing the thing because you're not afraid. It's being afraid and doing it anyways, right? Success is not, the, it's not doing the thing because there aren't challenges, right? It's facing the challenges and taking action anyhow. And I really appreciate the way that the three of you have held that up for us. Um, as some closing words, um, I would like to offer a reflection from Joanna Macy, um, who's a Buddhist and interfaith environmental teacher and activist who's been working on these questions for a long time. This is actually from a, a piece of her um, teaching that's been around from, for a long time. This is from 1993 in Tricycle Magazine. Uh, she wrote about the importance of environmental action. And, what, and how that relates to what it means to be human. She, she wrote, what do we have going for us? I've come to realize that we have a lot going for us. First, it helps to remember your true nature. Action is not something you do, it's something you are. In other words, you're not a noun, you're a verb. That is our true nature. So action isn't a burden to be hoisted up and lugged around on our shoulders. It's something we are. The work we have to do can be seen as a kind of coming alive. More than some moral imperative, it's an awakening to our true nature, a releasing of our gifts. This flow through of energy and ideas is at every moment directed by our choice. That's our role in it. We're like a lens that can focus or a gate that can direct this flow by schooling our intention. In each moment, we can give it direction. Thanks to the three of you and to Kaufman for uh, making it possible for us to be in conversation. It's been a real pleasure. Kim, back to you. Well, 
What an amazing two hours. Thank you so much to Sarah King and Reverend Parrish as moderators and to all of our panelists for such an exciting and engaging interfaith panel conversation and for sharing your time and wisdom with us. And gratitude also to all participants for being here with us this afternoon. As we close our time together, I wanted to mention that this is the middle of a three-part grand dialogue. And we have six workshops happening this coming week on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. All details on these workshops, as well as how to register, are available at interfaithunderstanding.org. Please also take a quick moment to complete our survey. It is available in the chat and will be emailed to you as well after the conclusion of this event. The Kaufman Interfaith Institute is honored to offer a wide variety of events and resources to foster cross-cultural engagement and cooperation between people of diverse religious, spiritual, and secular backgrounds. Much more information about us and our programming can be found at interfaithunderstanding.org. Thank you so much once again, and have a wonderful rest of your Sunday.